instead of just being able to walk around the campus in our cities, we were in uniform. And if there were two of us, one had to be in charge of the other and give commands. So here we are, you know, passing the rest of the cast who were headed to the theater to do between classes to rehearse the play that I was going to be in too, and so was George Anderson, who came out of the Deep South and were in uniform, <laughs> walking along. Everybody else is just, you know, with their book, books and the way students are, we're going, two, three, four, by the left flank, ho, ho, <laughs> just two of us, one in charge of the other. <laughs> it was just insane. Two days before graduation, they called me in and they said, uh, this is General this and this is General that and this is gen the generals, three generals sitting there. And all the questionable ones were being given time with these generals to prove that they were capable of being officers. And, and the uh, general said, we have complaints about you that you don't understand the spirit of the bayonet. And they said, do it. I'll teach us about the spirit of the bayonet. So I'm going, you know, long thrust and hold, ha! You know, we're doing all that stuff and pushing the imaginary body off the bayonet so that you can have another go at it. And uh, they, they looked pretty hopeful, but the word came down that I had to cancel my uniform that I had ordered that was going to cost some money. And uh, so Jack Swift and I were split up. He graduated. I didn't. And they shoved me into this asshole company where nobody fit and to wait assignment to some fort so they they said the Straub said putting Stern as an infantry officer would be like trying to plant a rose in the desert so I was a rose The Germans were only a quarter of a mile above us, this little hamlet. And, and that's where uh, the attack came. They moved much of their artillery and everything else down to confront us. And all we knew, because uh, I was on the front, the only thing in front of me before the German lines was 400 yards ahead of me, which was a listening post. And then you talk very quietly because you didn't want the enemy to hear you. And I said, there's something going on. I hear horses. I hear voices. I hear, I said, for the, this whole day I've been hearing and they said, well, we're going to have to send a, a patrol in, but we can't because we don't know where the minefields are. And I had my squad and it inherited this filthy pigsty of a, of a bunker, which they made out of, they, they cut down into the mud and then they put logs over that as a, as a ceiling and over that dirt and over that turf and odd canvas, anything to keep the rain from dripping in.
And all of a sudden, this hell broke loose all along the Siegfried line in front of them, you know, firing artillery and pounding, pounding artillery and those Nebelwerfer, those howling, screaming memes, five barrel mortar with those that wine every wine every they fired in sequence so there'd be five yowls going through the night this terrible scream and then it would cut off and you would never know you'd have to wait to hear where it had hit and then there'd be a big explosion and but this was all new to it. But no, nobody had even heard a cannon fire, a German cannon, an a, a, D, 88. And then they, they turned on these green floodlights underneath, under the fog, and lit the fog up in green. And then music came. They had classical music playing from various points through and then uh, Axis Sally or whatever her name was there mocking us saying have a nice night 106th division we know who you are and then our whole front erupted and uh, they got a surprise at the amount of fire that we were. But I was trying to keep people sane. The squad was in such confusion, except for a few. But hit by this, they just, one, one of them just he jumped over the parapet and rushes, I said, Rogers, don't, you know, and he's, so he, he, he said, this is, I'm making scheissen, shit for the Germans. And he, he shit in this ammo thing and, and threw it and got shot in the ass. He was our first casualty. <laughs> Rogers got shot in the ass. And then there was another one who wanted to learn how to draw horses. This is under this barrage. So I'm teaching him how to draw, draw a horse. He, was, he didn't know where he was. And then he drew a horse. I said, that's really, that's great. You know, keep on drawing horses. <laughs> oh, this is crazy. I, the things things had gotten so awful, and uh, it was being pounded and pounded, and and that's when they made me cleave my my squad, and I went down in there to see my platoon commander and ask him if there was any any instruction about a compass reading to withdraw if we had to withdraw. And he said, there's no, we're, we're not withdrawing. The orders are to stay till the last man. And I got back, put these donuts down and showed up at my trench with the donuts. And then I had to tell my assistant squad leader who was across the road, and the guy whose picture I showed you, that he was going to have to stay there. Because the order was that squad leaders would withdraw with half their squad. And the other half, with the assistant squad leader, would stay on that ridge until dawn, if they could hold out till then, but to, to cover our retreat. 
and to leap on their own on this same compass reading. And that's when I just, I was no good for anything except to follow my captain. And he had a, a raincoat that I could see in the dark. And I had my six guys behind me and I was holding on to his belt, his raincoat belt. And, and we hadn't had anything to eat until those donuts came. The buddy who knows you in a way that nobody else in the world does and whom you know better than anybody else in the world and that you would die for and, uh, and any guilt that you feel of the, of the kind that I felt uh, of that special bond is a, is a betrayal of yourself and you can't live it, live with it. You can't live with it. It's too much for the human being to carry around. And in my case, it illuminated my life even as it destroyed many, many things in, in life. And, uh, but that's why it's so precious to me. And, and I understand what it's like to lose your buddy or to feel that you've shortchanged him, which is behind so much of the PTSD, the feeling that you didn't do enough.